a fancy back deck on the, actually, it was at Andy Sontag's house in Taylor. I was putting the deck on the back of his house a number of years ago, and uh, um, got to talk about hymns and songs, and um, I brought up Fanny Crosby, and I was kind of partial to her because I had read a biography. Is that where somebody writes it about you? A biography? Autobiography is when you do it. Am I saying that right? Amen. Um, so I was kind of partial to a lot of her songs, you know, and, and they're popular and we know them. They're, they're wonderful, blessed assurance and, and whatnot. And he said, well, uh, he, he said, I, and in his words, he said that the greatest songwriter of our time, he believed, was Gary Duty. And that shocked me for a moment, but then I thought, you know what? He's written some really, really good doctrinal songs, and, and he just might be right, amen. And I know there's preferences involved and whatnot, but man, I, I, and Gary Duty wrote that song. I, I love it, I love it. Exodus chapter 12, verse 6, and we'll be there in a moment. I got to get there. I normally have my message right in my Bible, but I was looking for a song just before we sang. I don't know if you knew that. Amen. Miss Darla took my song from me. I can't tell you how many times when uh, his, his pastor was um, you know, not feeling good and preaching and not preaching, and, and, and sometimes I was up here or he was up here, our Bibles looked the same. I can't say he took my Bible like... A lot. <laughs> I have to go hunt them down, amen, just to preach that morning. Amen. About a year ago, uh, Rachel, was it a year ago or two years ago when Ray, my, my mom was in that accident? Two years ago now. Wow. My mom was in a bad accident. We all know about it. And she hit a tree, and um, um, she, was, she, she, she woke up. She, she had a, it was a, a blood issue that she had. So in her own body, she just was weak, and she fell asleep while driving. And um, she woke up to smoke in the cab really bad, and um, her door wouldn't open. And she was kind of stuck on the steering wheel, and she just she, she couldn't get, or, or her seatbelt or something, I think it was. Her seatbelt was, was, she couldn't get it or whatever. But through the panic, she was stuck there, and she couldn't get her door open. And, and a young man, thankfully, was driving by. Obviously, the Lord knew about it, but he couldn't open her door. Then he got over to the other side and pulled my mom out and uh, saved her life. And I would imagine that my mom would always be grateful for what that young man did. We got to meet him, and it was a wonderful thing, and my brother had a special service at his church for him and really did that, and uh, um, it, it, was, it was good. It was, it was on the news. It was on Channel 7. And I had people calling that I haven't heard of in years saying, hey, I saw your mom. I'm glad she's okay. Um, but that, that boy was fine, and, and he wasn't hurt at all. Thank the Lord for that. My mom will be forever grateful for that, especially our family will be forever grateful for that. And so much the more, if that boy would have died while saving my mom, we would have been even so much the more grateful in a somber respect, but also with a grateful respect, much like we celebrate Memorial Day for our soldiers. We, with a somber respect, thank, thank God for soldiers that we have our freedom. We ought to be thankful. I use that as a jumping off point. Do, do you remember when, when God used all those plagues in Egypt? In the, remember the final plague? God took the firstborn of everybody, man and beast, the firstborn out of all of them. And that was Israel too. God's own people would lose their firstborn if Israel didn't do what God said. And what was that? They had to kill a lamb. And they had to take the blood from that lamb. And, and there was a few things they had to do there, but essentially they had to to kill this lamb the day before Passover, and they would take that blood and they would put it on the doorpost of the house. Then, the, then when the death angel would come through that night, because the death angel was going to take everybody, every firstborn son, and every it was going to affect everybody. 
And as long as that blood was there, the firstborn would be safe. And that's what the song was about. Um, I, I'm not a, I don't look to the clouds and say, look, it's a cross. God's with us today. I don't look at the reflection of a shadow and say, man, that's, you know, that gives me goosebumps. No, I don't do that. Uh, plenty of people do always looking for something, and, and I think it causes more discouragement than anything. But I'm not saying that God doesn't do things and move in special ways. Uh, Rachel, we had Christmas songs ready to go and, and, and that we wanted to sing. Uh, Rachel's voice just couldn't do it. And I thought, well, Lord, what song, what, what song can we do this morning? And I just saw the song. I thought, man, it would be perfect for the message, and so it was. God told his people to celebrate with a feast, and it was called Passover. Because it was a Passover, the angel of death would pass over the house. That's why it was called Passover. We sing the song, I will pass, I will pass over you. Point number one this morning is the Old Testament lamb. Did you know, and, and I just learned this this week, did you know that that the, the, on the Jewish calendar, the 14th day of the month is called the Day of Preparation. It's on the eve of Passover. That, the, the, that day of preparation on the 14th day of the month, that's, that's when it was that all the firstborn in Egypt uh, uh, died and any in Israel that didn't follow the word of God and put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost. It was on the 14th day because that night, It'd be Passover, right? Let's pray and we'll, let's get in the message. Brother Zollers, would you open in a word of prayer and we'll get into the message, brother. Amen. Exodus chapter 12, verse 6 says, And you should keep, keep it up until the 14th day of the month. This is God's instruction for keeping Passover. Notice it says the 14th day of the month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Jump to verse 13. And the blood shall uh, be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. There's a song, Ms. Darla. And the plague shall not be unto you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Look at verse 26. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed the head and worshiped. It's quite interesting if you look and throughout your Bible and you want to do a Bible study that the number 14 is very much associated with deliverance and salvation. I didn't know that till this week. And we did a whole series on numerology for what, six weeks or so? There, there's... there's uh, 22 mentions in scripture associated with the number 14 in salvation, deliverance. And I would encourage anybody and everybody, go home and find them. Go find, that's how we get rooted in the word. Of, that's where we get our peace that passes understanding because you have such a sure foundation. That way when something happens, we don't fall like dandelions in the field, amen. And so it was on the 14th day, which is the day of preparation, that the Jews would shed the blood of a perfect little lamb to commemorate how God had given his people salvation from death. And so the Passover is what you would call a foreshadowing. And I remember, I don't know how old I was. It would be embarrassing to tell. I don't know. But I was way too old that I should have known what foreshadowing means. We know that when we have a shadow, it's like, we can kind of look behind us or wherever the sun is, I guess. We could look and see the, a shadow, and it's, it's an outline of what we are. It's not a mirror. It's a shadow, and we can, it, it outlines who we are. 
a foreshadowing is when the shadow's in front of you. And that's what happens so often throughout Scripture. It's full of it, full of it, foreshadowing, foreshadowing. And you know what is amazing is foreshadowing always points to Jesus Christ. Always, always, always. You know, uh, I don't think that our Lord Jesus Christ, our God, the God of Abraham, flies by the seat of his pants. That, that, that's why, that's why there, there, there's, there's hundreds, hundreds of prophecies about Jesus. There, there's so many prophecies, it just, it, the, the statistics is so far great. Uh, for it to, to come true, it's, it, it defies all reason and logic and reality of what could happen physically and earthly without any outside intervening from a God of the creator of the universe. Amen. But that's what the Passover was. It was a foreshadowing of things to come. They knew that. And we know that. Number one, the Old Testament lamb. Number two, the New Testament lamb. Look at Matthew chapter 1, 1. Matthew chapter 1, 1. It says the book of uh, the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And it goes on, and it goes on. And, and Matthew gives us the complete genealogy of Jesus Christ. And when you're trying to read through your Bible and you're getting your four chapters a day, that's some hard reading sometimes. But it's there to prove that Jesus Christ is who he says he was. It's not just something random. It's not just something that somebody said. No, there's proof in the pudding, so to speak. Amen. Look at verse 16. And Jacob, be, uh, yeah, Jacob begat Joseph, the son of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations from Adam to David are... 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon and the Christ are 14 generations. Now Matthew chose and decided to, 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 to divide the genealogy of Christ into three parts. 14, 14, 14. We know that the book of Matthew is inspired, so God set it up that way. But did you notice that the 14 is a prominent number there? Often, maybe every time, but often throughout Scripture, a day of, uh, 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 represents salvation and deliverance. Remember how the day of preparation was on the 14th day of the eve of Passover? You remember how, how the Passover was a foreshadowing of things to come? I don't think I could spell it out anymore. The foreshadowing was Jesus Christ. God's son sent to die on a cross as a perfect little lamb. Amen. Here's the thing. Turn to Mark chapter 15, verse 37. Mark chapter 15, verse 37. That Passover lamb was slain on the 14th day of the month, the day before Passover, on the eve of it. Matthew divided Christ's genealogy into 14 days. Look at, look at this. Jesus Christ was crucified in the day of preparation, the eve of Passover. Look at Mark chapter 15, verse 37. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. By the way, what did he cry? Book of John tells us, chapter 19, he said, it is finished. It is finished. Jump to Jump to verse 39. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw uh, that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Jump, jump to verse 42. And now when the even was come, because it was the, the preparation, that is the day before Sabbath. And you say, wait, Sabbath was the seventh day for them. Right. The year that Jesus died, Sabbath, uh, uh, Passover fell on a Sabbath day. So the day of preparation was also the day before Sabbath, which was the day before Passover that year. Amen. So in the Old Testament, while still in Egypt, amen, turn to Revelation 14 while I'm preaching away. So in the Old Testament, while still in Egypt, the Jews 
experienced salvation from physical death through the shed blood of a spotless lamb. And these same people, you say same people, I mean God's chosen people about 1,600 years later, they literally witnessed spiritual salvation. Salvation spiritually from spiritual death through a spotless lamb, the spotless lamb. In, in the Old Testament, you see, I just want to make this real plain. In the Old Testament, when they would kill that lamb, and they put the blood over the doorpost. That wasn't spiritual salvation. That was physical salvation. But it was a foreshadowing of things to come. And 1,600 years later, on the same day, the 14th day of the month, the day of preparation, the day before Sabbath, Jesus Christ, the spotless lamb, was hanging as the sacrifice for our sins. And he took upon him uh, our sins. And we put our trust, just like in the, in the Old Testament, God's people put their trust in the shed blood over the doorpost, or over their house. We're putting our trust in the shed blood of the New Testament lamb over this house. And if you're not doing that, you're not being saved spiritually. You see, the, the Jews, they had a choice to make. They didn't have to put blood over the doorpost. And it could be that maybe some didn't. I don't know. But they had a choice to make, just like we have a choice to make. We, we can trust what the Word of God says and, and cover ourselves with the blood or not. Amen. The difference is they did it for physical salvation. We're doing it for spiritual salvation. Amen. It's almost like God meant it when he said, be doers and not hearers only. Amen. Um, Amen. The Passover celebration. Um, I, I want to stress that. Let, let me stress this point before I go forward. I'm doing good on time. We won't be much longer. Don't worry, Jimmy. You've heard that term just because you're, 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 in the choir doesn't mean you can sing, right? Just because you're in the mechanic place doesn't mean you're a mechanic. And just because you're a church member doesn't mean that you're a child of God. Just because you're a Jew, just because you're part of Israel didn't mean that your firstborn son would automatically be saved. You, you know what? Just because a Jew that lived in Israel during that time, or was part of Israel that lived in Egypt during that time, just because they believed that, that in that lamb didn't save them from physical death. They could even believe that that lamb is real, and they could believe that there's saving power in that lamb, and that if they just uh, put their, tr their trust in the shed blood of that lamb on the doorpost, they could even know that and believe that, but that doesn't save them. They still have to obey the word of God and receive the promise and say, you know what God said? This is what I must do. Put that blood on the doorpost. Just as we today, just be, we, can, we can be a church member and we can be the most faithful. We could tithe the most. We could whatever. Check all the boxes. Do the most good. Give to whatever charities. We can say, I believe in the Son of God. I, you can even say, I believe in the Son of God's going to save. You could, he came to save the world from his, our sins. And I'm a sinner. You can even say that. That doesn't mean you're accepting it. You have to obey what the Word of God tells us. We have to receive that promise. It's called being born again. John chapter 3 tells us all about it. We'll be there in a moment. Amen. Amen. But we, if, 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 if somebody, let me just say this, move on. I got I to gotta move on. If somebody, just like my mom, saved her life, if somebody were to save your life, don't you think you'd be a little bit grateful? If somebody saved your life and died for your life, you'd be even more grateful. But let alone somebody died for you to save your life for eternity 
in heaven with all the benefits for eternity. Yet we still get our underwear in a bunch if somebody isn't kind to us good enough. Or if, or if, if things don't just work out just the way we see it, or we get a flat tire on the way to church or to work, we just think the whole world's coming undone. But look at, look at what we've been saved from if you're saved this morning. We have nothing to gripe about. God's been so good to us. That I, I guarantee you, when all of Egypt, all of the firstborn in Egypt died and all the cattle and they all died, I guarantee you, every Jewish family was, 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 was so thankful with the somber gratefulness that that lamb died for us. But thank you, God, we trusted in your word and our firstborn lived and we can see that everybody else died. Church, we ought to be so thankful that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. We were worse off than sitting in the truck and couldn't get out. We were hanging on and not wanting to get out. Amen. Amen. So the Jews celebrate Passover. And we, you know what? We celebrate and we commemorate the birth of Christ with every service that we have. We celebrate the death, burial, and the resurrection with every meeting that we have. You know, we're, we're, we're just eating in the back in, in a next Sunday night. But you know what? We're doing that in Jesus' name. Amen. We look back at the cross as a memorial for what it, he did for us, right? The Passover lamb for all mankind. We celebrate his birth specifically on Christmas Day. More importantly, I believe we celebrate Resurrection Day. There's no greater day than Resurrection Day. Amen. Number one, the Old Testament lamb. Number two, the New Testament lamb. But this is exciting. Number three, Miss Jessica, that's my final point, the risen lamb. Look at Revelation 1.1. I don't know, I told you Revelation 14, didn't I? Revelation 1.1, we'll be at 14 in a minute. Revelation 1.1, I just want to point out who's telling John what to write. We know this, but let's see it and really sink it into our hearts. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear the record of the word of John. No, who bear the record of the word of God. Miss Jen caught that, amen. And of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So just to be really, really clear, John is only writing what God told him to, not John's opinion, but just as he saw through the word of God. Now, now jump to Revelation 14.1. I just wanted to make that super clear. This wasn't, this wasn't some collaboration from the disciples to try to make something happen. This was this was the word of God through John, amen. Revelations 14.1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the, Mount, on the Mount Zion. John saw a lamb in heaven, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. And, and I heard a voice from heaven as a voice of many waters, and as a voice of a great thunder. And I heard a voice of harpers harping with their harps. Jump to verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are, these are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. Uh, these were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits of God and to the Lamb. You say, what are you talking about? Why, why are you bringing that up? Because God's making it very clear that that Passover lamb from the Old Testament that was a foreshadowing to the New Testament, the lamb, the sacrifice, is alive and well up in heaven. Amen. The lamb, amen. Turn to John chapter 3, verse 1. I think we get used to seeing and hearing John 3, 16. We see it on the football fields and we hear it in church often. It just kind of kind of rolls through and we're just so used to hearing it. Like some people that give compliments way too often. It don't mean as much sometimes when we just use it too much. Amen. I thank God that his word never returns void. Amen. 
But just to be clear, in John chapter 3 here, we're looking at Jesus' words himself. Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus. John chapter 3 verse 1 it says, There's a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Brother Larry Bell is going to be here with us in two weeks, day after Christmas. His testimony, and he'll probably give it while he's preaching. He often does. He's working at GM, and there was a man, a, a, a saved, born-again believer that was witnessing to, to Larry Bell. And Larry Bell, wanted to, he wanted to just argue and debate and just really give him some, you know. So, But this man, they they spend lunches together, and this man would have his Bible there and trying to show him salvation. And where Larry Bell would be, well, yeah, but what about, I don't know, a gap theory or what about dispensations or what about whatever topic you can if God could can is can God make a rock so big he can't lift it I don't know but Larry Bell would try to stump him on all these things he could find and this this patient man I don't know who he was he would say we'll get to that but this is more important and brother Larry Bell would bring somebody he'd say we'll get to that but this is more important so Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he's saying first of all he came by night that's questionable. Like, either he was working all day or maybe he was embarrassed for people to see. I don't know. But he comes to Jesus. He says, we know that that must be a master come from heaven. And Jesus basically goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look. And he starts telling him how you need to be born again. Jesus made it very clear. We do that oftentimes when we get sucked into that. Don't get sucked into the debate. Just talk salvation. Uh, uh, else you're casting your pearls before your spine. Uh, pearls before the swine. Amen. Thanks, Miss Darla. Wow. I don't know where that came from. Jesus said, verse 3, Jesus answered, send them, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And it was then, at that moment, that Jesus said what we call John 3, 16. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Keep in mind. This is Jesus himself speaking to Nicodemus. Jesus is witnessing to a man trying to tell him how to get saved. These aren't verses that are commonly used in, say, a works-based religion. My dad grew up Catholic. He didn't know this verse. He went to catechism. He didn't know this verse. Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, that the world through him might be saved. As we celebrate Christmas this year, church, can we not miss the forest for the trees? And we say this, but let's not forget what we're celebrating. The busyness with the nativity. You know, me and Brother Vipon are going to be at each other's throats this week at some point, decorating. No. But let's not forget the purpose of what we're doing while we're doing. I expect to have a great time at the nativity alone, and it's going to be one. I look forward to the fellowship, but that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it to, to evangelize, to get the gospel out. That's why we're doing it. But we're doing it so, so when somebody says, man, those are beautiful Christmas trees you have all over. We'll say, man, aren't they beautiful? But did you know that Jesus Christ was actually talking to Nicodemus in John 3, 16? He was literally telling him how to be born again. And it had nothing to do with works. Can you believe that? There's nothing that Nicodemus could do on his own. Jesus was telling him that. Turn to Titus chapter 2, verse 11. It'll be our last scripture this morning. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. See, let's not forget that Christmas is really the perfect spotless lamb that came to this earth to be slain on that 14th day, the day of preparation, the eve of Passover, so that we could have spiritual life and not spiritual death. 
Let's not forget that. That's really the reason for the season. And it might sound cliche, but it's so absolutely true. Because it's easy to get wrapped up in things. And I love all the holiday things. Amen. Amen. But see, God didn't tell us to live our best lives now. God didn't tell Nicodemus, you know what, just look at the t how the disciples live their lives and that's enough gospel message. Just, just watch how I live my life and let my testimony be the gospel to you. That's not what Jesus said at all. In fact, Jesus said to the disciples, go teach and preach, go into the, all, into the earth, go into all nations. Be ye doers and not hearers only. Jesus himself said, go and do, not sit and stay and relax. Not work as much as you can. He said, go and do, preach, teach, get the gospel out. Maybe this year we can not just say Merry Christmas, particularly at the Nativity, but all year in the season, not just say Merry Christmas, but say, hey, Merry Christmas. Did you know that um, the, the Passover lamb is actually pointing to the same Christmas lamb? And they'll say, what are you talking about, Christmas lamb? Let me tell you about him. His name's Jesus. And actually, he was, as a lamb, uh, go, gone to the slaughter, and Isaiah prophesied about it in chapter 53, and you can tell him all about the birth of Christ and how Passover and Christmas actually point to the same lamb. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. I, I like that. Some would say, well, it only appeared to everybody in the last 2,000 years. No. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Amen. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. If there was ever a Christmas message, it is the message of the Passover, looking to the foreshadowing of the lamb, the sacrificial lamb, the lamb. There's no more sacrifice ever needed. No more need of a priest to sacrifice lambs anymore. The veil's broken. Christmas lamb, the Passover Christmas lamb. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for your salvation. Thank you for sending me.